This episode is in English and English will return shortly. Herra nú fara að hlýna úti. Er fólk búið að fylla á boxinn og öll græja hnýtinga græjur? Já, sko nú er nú er hnýtinga sí sem er klárast, februarflugur er klárast. Ég fór að tók nokkur köstum helgina. Já, gaman. Gott, gott að komast aðeins út engin fiskur en það var svo sem aukaatri. Það er viðraveðlutnar og svona mikja öxlina. Já, ég komst að ég þarf að renna í veðflugur. Ég þarf að ná mér í hérna sjálfsögðu nýja tauma, en það var svona ein og ein lína sem að Já. sem að lífið ekki veturinn af og hérna, þetta er kannski ekki alltaf til fyrirmyndar hvernig maður gengur frá og svona en það er, það er bara partur að þessu það er að fara yfir græjurnar og, og hérna fyrir svona fyrsta alvur túr falin er veðiflugur, fyrir göttin og heils upp að gretar og, og hérna kíkja á strákana og fá okkur bolla Já, nákvæmlega Svo er það Viking Light þeir standa náttúrulega með, með okkur í þessu byrgir Jú, jú Það var hérna einn bóndi á bakkarum Já, gekka við bara áttast að hiti og það var alveg hægt að láta fara vel um sig í mosa sko Já, ekki, já, þeir, þeir eru alltaf með mann þarna á bakkanum, góðu vinir Og loop merch engin, sko, nú, nú er fresh, það er náttúrulega bæði til greitabúl, það var ekki einn hvítu póki, neginn staðar sjálfur, hefur ekki reyna að halda því svoleiðis í sumar og hérna skilum ekki bakki eftir á bakkanum situð aftur í boxið eða í vasan eða whatever, bara skila því eitthvað staðar annars staðar inn á bakkan og það eru snillikarnir í loopmerge.is sem að hjálpa okkur að bera út þennan bóðskap og svo er það Tokyo Tokyo Sushi í dag þetta sem Tokyo það er afslátakóðin, hilur tíu það er í appinu, vefsíðunni á kassanum, sjálfsagreislunni allstaðar farið að ná ykkur í nýju serjetina þeir eru algjört sjálfgeti kjúklinga katsu Uff. það er líka fiskur úr landildi Laxin. Fiskur og landildi, það er það sem við stöndum fyrir, við viljum ekki sjá þetta sjóveldi strassl. Alls ekki. Finally we get Klaus. Finally. Yeah. We've known Klaus for quite a while and people I'm sure our listeners know him as well. He's a head designer of Loop Tackle, designs those fantastic rods and also has been a guide here in Iceland for what, 20 years or something? Yeah, probably. Constantly tanned. Constantly. Always in good spirits. So yeah, it was, a, it was a true pleasure of speaking to Klaus and good to get a little bit of insight of how rods are designed, how lines work and tapers and liters and all that. Yeah, and just uh, fishing in other countries. Hearing his story. Yeah, steelhead, uh, rainbows. Interesting guy that definitely doesn't lead your normal life and has taken this sport to the extreme. Yeah, so Klaus, take it away. Klaus, welcome to Hillerin. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for finally being invited. It's good. To <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I got that little little toxic slide there. Uh, nice seeing you in February. Good yeah. to see you still have a tan. Nice. Uh, yeah, let's just dive into it. Uh, how did you? How did this journey of yours start in in fly fishing? Oh, in fly fishing. Okay. Or fishing in general. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I started like any other boy in Denmark. We have the luxury of uh, being able, when I grew up, for nothing. It's basically free, all the trout rivers and stuff. You might have to be a member of a local fishing club for a very limited amount of money, and you could just go fishing. So that opened the doors for a lot of youngsters, and even today, and hopefully we can touch that later on. Um special programs for youngsters in the fishing clubs and mm -hmm. still, you know, fairly affordable for everybody. But back in the days, it was, we might have to pay five Danish kroners to go fishing on a river and catch trout. And paid the local farmer and it was perfect. Now, so, how old were you when you started this? I don't know. I can't remember. I, I, I just remember where we, when I started fishing it was my parents they bought a <coughs> my dad bought an old fishing vessel like a fishing boat and uh, rebuilt it to a floating summer house and nice. my brothers and my sister and me we were forced into this boat and what else could <laughs> you do but but fish so we spent both my parents were teachers so we had a long summer vacation and <clears throat> we could just do nothing but fish so great caught a lot of you know flounders and whatever back in the when i started out and then 
my parents finally decided to buy a real summer house on land and there <laughs> was a small lake and we fished there and you know for roach and perch and whatever and then you know in the summer evenings you would see these fish come up and they would start feeding off the surface and my dad had an old glass fiber fly rod and I nicked it out of his cupboard he never fished really with a fly rod but uh, I I borrowed it and tried to imitate whatever these fish were eating, like small mosquitoes and stuff. And uh, that's probably the first e experience I had with fly fishing. But Did it immediately become an obsession or fishing was an obsession at the time? But yeah. With anything, you know, not not just fly fishing, but bait and spin and whatever. And then I started fishing with some friends of mine and, and <clears throat> I spent uh, summer vacation sometimes with my grandparents. There was a sea trout river and we bicycled like four in the morning out to the river. I mean, nobody would let the kids do that today. I mean, pitch black dark on a road with no bicycle track or nothing and heavy trucks and lorries yeah. hauling ass <laughs> by you, right? Just bicycling out to go fishing, so. We fished, that was mainly with, in the beginning, with uh, small rapalas and small spoons and stuff like that. And then I remember later on when I started fishing sort of for for the bigger sea trout in the river Caro, went back home and uh, I caught like a, I can't remember, 10, 12 pound fish on a rapala thingy. Nice. And I looked at this fish it was like a May fish, like early, early run, silver. Um, I looked at the fish and it's like, why didn't I catch that on a fly? I mean, yeah. and it was like, okay, maybe you need to fish more with a fly in order to catch one on a fly. So from then on, it was just full on fly fishing. So. How is the fishing in Denmark? I mean, I've seen photos of all these big sea trout, mm -hmm. huge salmon. Mm -hmm. But the background doesn't seem very interesting. It's a very canal-like rivers and maybe colored. And they have a little sandy color to them because there's a lot of um, uh, uh, sediment floating in the rivers. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine fell in and he was looking up and he said, it's pretty clear. <laughs> 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 but they look more colored than they actually are. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not. There's no mountains in Denmark. No, right? So it's all flat. It's flat, but there's. It's. It's not like the rivers aren't moving. We just don't have the waterfalls or whatever like mm -hmm. you have here. It's a. Uh, it's just a steady a, push. Yeah, you don't have a head and a tail and a pool. No, but then again, it's if you have an Icelandic salmon river is, let's say, if we take five kilometers of an Icelandic salmon river, how much of that is actually fishable? Mm -hmm. Right, it might be ten percent, or or whatever it is. It depends on the river, of course. In Denmark, it's different. They can be everywhere. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right, so everything is fishable. So you have ten five kilometers of river, you can f actually catch a fish in every single meter of those five kilometers. Uh, and then so, of course you have turns and yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the where where the current has dug out a channel and stuff, but they will also be hanging on weed beds and stuff in the middle of the river in the middle of a flat bed that doesn't look like nothing. So, so, so the salmon there, are they are they Baltic nope. or are they Atlantic? Nope. Atlantic. Yeah. So they're completely different from Murrum and, and Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, and and what what would you fish for in Denmark if you were to go fly fishing for a, for salmon what the problem is, the way I see it right now, is that it's all sinking line fishing. It all has to be super heavy stuff. Like, s the faster the sinking line you have, the better. But back in the 90s and the 80s, when the salmon population pretty much was non-existing, there was... I used to work in a tackle shop by the River Skjern in the 90s. That's kind of the famous river yeah, yeah, yeah. in Denmark. And that was before they put it back into its original uh, uh, riverbed. Oh. Right? They channelized it in the, whatever it was, 1960s or 50s. Or, and they did that in order to sustain the food production for the people living there. So everybody's complaining about it now. A lot of people are complaining about that they destroyed nature back in the days. But it was like, yeah, but it was a life or death situation <laughs> for mm -hmm. the people living there. So 
finally they took the right step and put it back to its original uh, lie again. So, and uh, of course, this this is what two thousand, can't remember, two thousand nine or whatever. We can look it up, but uh, so it took some years before it actually sort of found its its natural uh, flow again and, yeah, and uh, started producing yeah, yeah, bugs and exactly. So. Um, yeah, no, it's been a great, great project. On, um, but back in the old days, it was like in the nineties. It was people came in; they would come into the shop with the salmon they caught, and it was like, okay, we need a big cake from the baker to celebrate this salmon. Right? Uh. That was like, it's like special to see a Danish salmon at the time. Maybe saw two or three a year or something. Shit. Uh. But why the sinking lines? Do you think it's because you have to use sinking lines no. or is it just a trend of the fishery, fishermen that fish there? It's first of all the trend and then it's, uh, it's I, I think and I believe in also what I've seen here is that once you start going deep on the fish, there's only one way forward. It's like a nuclear arms race, right? If you start coning, there's only one way. It's bigger and heavier, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's the same thing there because you're allowed to spin, you're allowed to worm fish. So you're just pushing these fish down and then the fishing pressure is quite high. I mean, I pay, well, I think it's like 1,800 Danish kroners a year. Mm -hmm. And I can fish from this, what is it, 16th of April when the river opens, 15th, 16th, I can't remember, to mid-October every day yeah. for 1,800 Danish kroners. Is that 30... 5,000 or whatever it is. And there's 6 million people in Denmark, so... Yeah. A lot of people fishing. It's a lot of people fishing, and the rivers are quite narrow, and you're walking up on the banks, and so, of course, you have 100 people walking over these fish, you push them down, and they get all these big spinners and, like, spoons and whatever chucked in their faces, so they stay down. Yeah, I, I've seen it here when he tried to come and fish on the surface with a small fly in a river that's been wormed all mm -hmm. summer or mm -hmm. something, you're not going to move those fish. No, no. So now I just look at the statistics. I did the st statistics for my home river in terms of uh, the total catches compared to method the last year. And it was 83.2% was, 80, was caught on spin or worm. Huh. So the rest is fly fishing. But if you look at the amount of people fishing with the fly versus spin, that's not the number you see. Mm -hmm. So, I don't I don't know what the solution is to that, but something has to happen. Uh, that's interesting, um, but also I mean when when there are so many people fishing for such few fish, and you are allowed to keep them, I assume. But I'm, it's not a few fish. I mean, so they did they did a every is it every second year or every third year or something? They do a population count in the Danish River, and I think now I might I I'm just thinking. I read the, the report the other day, and I think Skjern was 7,000 salmon in Ooh. total. And the store where I fished was 5,000 or something. Shit. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a small number of fish. But, of course, the rivers are much longer than the Icelandic ones. I mean, we're talking Jokla length at yeah. least. right? But even if you have five to 7,000 fish in Jokla, you're, that's a very good season for the, for the guys there. But then again, you have the same situation in, in the Icelandic rivers where if you have 80 kilometers of river, they're only in certain pl spots, mm -hmm. right? In Denmark, they can be anywhere in those. Yeah, true. Right? So, and of course, they, they also go into the tributaries and stuff, so they spread out. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a small number of fish. No. And they did some genetic studies and after a huge reproduction, uh, you know, uh, a hatchery program, but made sure that it was natural fish from the Danish rivers. It seems to be that we're genetically the same fish as 1913 or whatever it was. So okay. that's pretty good. That's cool. And, yeah. and I mean, they are big. They're hu huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you catch a 10 kilo fish, everybody's just like, yeah, whatever. So, okay, fine. What's a big scaring salmon? Over 15. 
That's, uh, yeah, that's I shouldn't be saying this in Iceland because we try to keep it to ourselves. <laughs> no, but... But I, I saw some photos somewhere. You and, and you went fishing there a yeah, few yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you even got a, a nice salmon there. You only got one, yeah. yeah. I wasn't huge. It's like 86 or 85 or something. Yeah, which is still a good fish everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so when did uh, fly fishing become a job for you and a career? That's probably when I started. That's at least where it really took off. And when I started working in this tackle shop in Denmark um, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I started on Easter. There's a, there's, in Denmark, there's a tradition for for when we could actually fish in the springtime. Now we can't. Season doesn't open until mid-April. It used to open in February or something. But there used to be a big tradition for Easter salmon fishing in Denmark. It was like mm -hmm. the thing, Easter salmon, right? There was no salmon, but it's a <laughs> tradition anyway. But So I started working in this tackle shop on Easter Saturday. And so I was thrown into the fire right away. And then um, the same afternoon, Saturday afternoon, we had a casting clinic with the Swedish Jörn Andersson. Ah. And so I had to attend that. And uh, actually a friend of mine offered me to come and join his casting clinic before I started working in the shop. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was uh, the world champion. I caught uh, some sea trout in the river there. And off in salt water, of course, and thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. You're not going to learn anything from, from Swedish hobo. No, exactly. Well, I was in for a surprise. I saw what he could with the fly rod, and I was like, okay. So I worked, what, five years in that store, and I did. After that, I ran all the casting clinics with him and joined him in Norway on his salmon fishing schools and fished with him and hunted with him and... So he was a, kind of a mentor in that oh, absolutely. casting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, famous, of course, for many listeners will probably remember the year and Nantes on Signature Series. Oh, for yeah, them, yeah, yeah, exactly. And after, you know, I've been in the industry for a long time now. I did most of the fly shows all around the world. And, and I've never seen anybody yet that could do what he could do with a fly rod, ever. Mm. So it, it's just... All credit to him. But how, I mean, you're very sort of well known for your for your casting mm -hmm. and casting instructions and, and double hand casting maybe in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Icelanders are in general very poor casters. Yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah. tells me. Yeah. You, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And there's a natural reason. <laughs> yeah? It's because the fishing is so expensive here that you cannot really uh, go out and practice a whole lot. You could practice on grass or a lake or something, but you don't get the real practice from on the fishing side mm -hmm. of things. I've also heard the explanation that there's, you know, maybe not at the moment, but traditionally there's always been enough, so much fish that you didn't really have to be a great caster or you wouldn't have time to focus on casting because you were always catching something anyway. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, but I see a lot of the guys in, in Sweden and Norway and Denmark and where fishing is fairly cheap and you can fish for a long period of time, especially in Denmark, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of good casters. Yeah. They get a lot of practice because it takes a lot of time to catch a fish, mm -hmm. you know, and you fish a lot. So the more you fish, the better you become. That's the way it is, right? the more you practice. Yeah, I've noticed that when you when you meet Scandinavians and, I mean, also British people, mm -hmm. a little bit different traditions mm -hmm. there and style, yeah. but they just they have so much more time to cast they think about it so much more mm -hmm. and maybe because it's a bigger part of the hobby just casting and enjoying casting rather than always being catching something oh yeah no no absolutely especially when there's no fish around <laughs> and it becomes it's like i look at it a little bit like this. it's it's like fly tying right so it becomes a hobby within the hobby mm -hmm. right so you're you're some people take it to the extreme and tie traditional uh, salmon flies and has to be the right feathers and yeah. stuff like that and then I, I, for me personally in the casting game it was I was trying to teach people in the in the beginning exactly like yeah. I have a 
background in the military. So it was very much like, it has to be this way, right? But Trying to get everyone to be the next year in Anderson. Or yeah, 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 exactly. They just need to be uh, able to cloning to fish. myself, yeah. right? But realize that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a few, you know, that really want it because it takes a lot of practice. So, and uh, it's all muscle memory. So if you don't practice it, it disappears. So Same with flight tying. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And a lot of flight tying you don't do because of the fish or the fishing. It's just for the flight tying itself. Mm -hmm. Probably same with casting. Yeah. No, absolutely. But with casting, I would say it's more important than the flies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go into that a little mm -hmm. bit. No, but I mean, it doesn't matter. You can have the best fly in the world if you can't present it to the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would completely agree. So I, I've... I mean, obviously, we're sitting here at, at me and Birke's little studio surrounded by flies of all sizes, colors. And mm -hmm. There's a tarpon fly yeah. <laughs> sitting in front of you. Um, yeah, but if you don't present it, so I've personally started looking a few years ago more into leaders and line and equipment, how I can start fishing my fly as soon as it lands and all of that. Do you have like a, a rule of thumb for listeners that, because always the first question is when you land in a lodge and, oh, how did it go? We got three. What fly? People try to solve the problem there. Mm -hmm. What would be sort of your, your pointers to help people solve the problem? Because it's not, it's not red or black, Francis. You've seen my car. There's a sticker on it that mm -hmm. says, it's not the fly. You suck. Yes. All yeah, right. That. <laughs> so that's basically. The <laughs> it's true, though. Yeah. It, and partly. I don't know, you guided a lot yourself and, and anybody who's guided enough knows when you're with the client and you see the cast and you see the speed of the line when you're salmon fishing. That's what I'm talking about right now, not trying. Mm -hmm. but, and you just know the speed is right. It, it, it's hard to explain, but you just know this is the right speed when you see it. Uh. You can't explain it before or after, but once you see the tip of the line dragging the fly, you just know this is going to work. Yeah, how many times have you had that moment? This is it. Yes. It's not the way you and, say and, and, it. You and you can make the cast before, and you just know, no, it's the wrong speed. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you hear the guide go, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's when, the moment. when he starts focusing, okay, okay, st strip when I say go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah that's, when, exactly. that's when you've made a nice cast. Mm -hmm. No, but it's, it's, and th this is where the presentation comes in now, the cast comes in. So, so you want to achieve that right, correct speed all the time. Right, And in order to do that, you need to be able to make that angle on your cast compared to the speed of water. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. reading water into it. And that's where I admire people like Tody Tun. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with, time with Tody talking about this. And he's like, if you want to be a great fly fisherman, you have to start worm fishing because you learn the speed of the water. And it's probably true. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tried once salmon fishing for, or worm fishing for salmon, but I took like five minutes, gave up. <laughs> and also, It's ex extremely difficult. Right? Also so on that same note, I mean, if you don't know how to how to cast well, mm -hmm. if you, if, let's say, you're fishing fast water and you need that tighter angle, 45 mm -hmm. and, and even tighter than that, mm -hmm. it requires you to, to make a long cast. Yeah, you can reach the fish with a square cast, yes. but it's not presenting. No. Right, so no. basics, of course you're not going to solve that situation by changing flies. You're, no, you're going to exactly. have to just get better at casting and mm -hmm. presenting. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is, it's, so, it's, so, it's such a cheap and simple thing to do. You have a fly rod, you have a fly line. And just and, and, um, try to sit, say this correctly, but it's so easy to go out and practice. And it's so it doesn't cost anything except from time. And but it it, it it adds so much more pleasure and enjoyment to your fishing trip that you don't have to worry about wind nuts or wrong presentations, broken hooks in the back cast and mm -hmm. you know, it, it I, I just don't get it, to be honest. You know. People coming on a an expensive salmon fishing trip and and, and not being efficient enough to present the fly correctly. I'm mm -hmm. not saying every single cast has to be perfect. You know, when I'm, yeah. you know, when you're fishing, you're 
enjoying yourself and you're not there trying to be Superman casting. You just chuck your fly out and hope for the best, right? It's, the way it's, it works. it's not a competitive sport. No, no, no. But you no, need no. to put in some minimum effort just to be able to enjoy it yeah. to the max. Yeah, there is yeah, definitely yeah. quality in, in quality of life, not having to worry about from which direction the wind is coming, whether you're going to be able to fish or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if you have a high bank behind you or mm -hmm. something, be able to present the fly in every situation that you'll end up in. I mean, just the shenanigans you go through as a guide of solving the problem of how can I get this person to fish over this, these fish in that mm -hmm. pool mm -hmm. with these conditions, yeah, yeah. with yeah. his cast. <laughs> and, and, and at the same time, if you get a, 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 a client that's a really good caster, and it also makes your life so much more enjoyable. Right? Then, then you can just start guiding. Exactly. exactly. Which is the which is what angle to cast and yeah. what flies. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when you have the presentation, then you, the flies can start to matter. Mm -hmm. If you're only mm -hmm. fishing every, uh, every third or fourth or tenth cast, you just strap on a sunray and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 can you... Is that a freaky? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a France, Red Francis no strip. Oh, okay. Because it, it tends to fish... Every way you bring it to a sure. fish, to some extent at least. Yeah. Um, can you explain to me a little bit? Because I know I've talked to you enough about rods and, and lines and liters and stuff to know that you've thought about all of this. Uh, tapered liters mm -hmm. in Iceland. Yes, they are becoming more popular, but they're still... It's taken me 20 years so far. Yeah, there's almost like people take great pride in not using tapered liters. Yes. Just using straight off the spool. Yes. Maxima. Maxima. One, yeah. two. One, two. Yeah. And then it's a, no, fancy foreigners can use the tapered leaders. Yes. What does a tapered leader do, Klaus? It makes your presentation right, what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Right? And it makes your, you can cast longer and, and, and less wind nuts. It's an extension of your fly line. So when you try to cast Let's say you have a, a head length on your fly that's 10 meters and you add like two of these of maxima, it lands like blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and, But instead you add like 13 foot of tapered leader plus a tippet, that turns over on its own by the energy transmission through the taper. So it just continues turning over and presents the fly. And this is, as you know, except from if you fish upstream with a conehead, It's the most important thing. If you want your fly to fish well, it lands on the straight end of a straight taper, mm -hmm. right? Or ta straight leader, sorry. And in the same angle as your fly line is going. Y exactly. Because often you see, okay, the fly line got there, but the fly is maybe above because the wind is upstream. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happens when you don't, that's with straight leaders. Mm -hmm. They don't turn over as well. So, so just that simple little trick. And I mean, it's such a cheap part of the equipment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even know what they cost here. Let's say they cost 1,500 kroners or something. It's, it's nothing compared to the full package of salmon fishing. No. And, and, and I'll bet you in the trout world, everybody fishes a tapered leader. You're more of a trout fisherman than I am. You explain to me why you fish a tapered leader in trout world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just makes it very much easier if you're dry fly fishing. There's no weight on the fly, obviously. So you need the need the leader to turn out, to transmit the energy mm. throughout the, to so the fly. Simple presentation. Yeah. Accurate presentation. It's and if you're fishing, uh, you know, two flies and uh, an indicator, mm. um, it just helps you not to tangle it, which is sort of the largest problems for most people starting to fish two flies and an indicator. Mm. They, mm. they stop because they're always tangled. Yeah, it's because your 10 pound straight mono just flows all in a ball yep. and creates a nest. Mm -hmm. So it just helps you turn your rig over. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, I don't, and, and, and like I said, it's, it costs nothing. It's, it's so cheap. Mm -hmm. And it ex extends your fly line. So basically, it, it, it for, for with the same amount of effort as you put in your cast, you get a couple of meters more for nothing. You know? mm -hmm. So you, you, you just get that extra distance for free. 
Yeah. Especially on the double handers. So it's all to do with the amount of energy that the fly line, when it turns over. Because mm-hmm. so you can have your taper leader too short as well. Oh, absolutely. And it bounces back because yeah, it's yeah. overloaded. So, yeah, and yeah. Or too thin in the butt section. So, yeah, or too thin. Huh? So, so it, but it all depends on the taper on your on your fly line, right? So, so it's the diameter of the tip of the fly line the, and the velocity or the speed of that one. So it's simple physics. Mm-hmm. And when you're looking at the... Half, it, what is it? Half times mass times velocity squared. Yeah. It's that simple. And, and also, I mean, you look at something, you, you let's say you want to fish a 12-pound test tippet. Mm-hmm. The tippet is completely separate from the liter. Mm-hmm. That doesn't serve the purpose of turning it over. So, you know, your butt section might be 100 pounds mm-hmm. tapering down to 20 pounds. Mm-hmm. Then uh, your tippet is 15, 12 or, or 15 or... Yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. So I, if you do the measurements on most of the tapered leaders, it has to be for a single-handed rod, you have to be in a butt section about 0.60 millimeters. Mm-hmm. I don't even know the braking strength on that. But it's a lot. It's a lot. You yeah. can tow a car <laughs> with that. <laughs> so that's about the diameter you want mm-hmm. in order to control the energy from the turnover of the fly line and then taper down to whatever. And I always go like a standard. It's m- most single-handed from five weights to eight weights, a 13-foot tapered leader. And then when you go into the switch and the lighter double handers like six and seven weights, it's 15 foot, and then anything above seven weight is 15, 17 feet. But that's what scares people because mm-hmm. I, I hear these numbers, mm-hmm. fif- you know, because everything is straight off the spool, rod length. Yeah, yeah. But it's a 15 foot liter is long for an eight foot rod, but it's short for a 13 foot. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. true. It's not meant to turn over the same length. No, but if the tape. If the leader has the right taper, it, you don't even feel it. I've, I've tried it so many times with mm-hmm. people guiding, like with a 13-foot, 8-weight, and I have a 20-foot leader on it. Yeah. And people don't even notice. No, if, like, they, oh. if they don't know about it, uh, oh. it doesn't hurt them. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I, w- I would ag- agree with that immensely. And, and when once you... Yeah, there's, there's always this question of trying to solve it with buying another fly or... Getting the right fly. A new rod. Yeah. <laughs> another rod, another line, another fly, everything but the leader. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And then there's also just the fact that the salmon you're trying to catch are not really seeing your line or you're not throwing your actual butt end of your line always on top of you're some fish. You're not lining the fish as much yeah. and all that. I, d- I don't know. Does that matter for salmon fishing? Or is it more trout? Uh, it's more trout. Yeah. But I believe it matters. I mean, we have some low water situations oh, yeah. here, and, and I'm just talking general. Maybe it, I mean the way you see, for example, we talked to to Freddy, mm-hmm. and he likes this downstream mend and and bring the line over in a belly to show them the profile of the fly. Mm-hmm. Of course, you're lining a lot of fish that way, mm-hmm. uh, but you're also showing them the whole fly, but not just the butt. No, but then again, if you fish. Uh, water with it, it's, you know, different color than here. You know, here mm-hmm. it's like gin this. clear. Yeah. Uh, so if you fish like Norwegian rivers, they often have a little brown tint to them, and mm-hmm. I think they're hotter. Hotter, I don't know. Maybe harder to spook. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I think that's. They're also deeper and yeah. If you're bigger, f- if you're fishing. 50 to 100 cubic meters versus 5 cubic meters in northern on July. It's yeah, exactly. It's not the same sport almost. No, no. So salmon fishing, you mm-hmm. talked about roaches and sea trout and stuff. Mm-hmm. When did you, because when I think of you, I think of obviously steelhead, which we're going to get into later, mm-hmm. but, but salmon, mm-hmm. is that, you know, of course there's the Danish salmon fishing early. You mentioned you went with the, you're on to... To, to Norway? Norway. Yeah, yeah. Was that sort of where the... Because salmon takes over for a lot of people. No, well, I th- yeah, probably back in those days it was Norway or Sweden. There was mm-hmm. a lot of people going to Murrum at the time, but I never went to Murrum. It's not 
my style of fishing, but it's too many people. And yeah. But I, I actually started before I had, I got my driver's license. I met the some people that fished the Strödal in Norway. So, and uh, they invited me to come, and I didn't have a driver's license or anything. So, either by train or okay. once I actually flew up there. When you can still have a cigarette in the, in the plane, <laughs> that many years ago. <laughs> but it was. Uh, that was that was pretty pretty fun, you know. You could uh, back in those days. It was it wasn't the same pressure on the rivers back in the eighties and mm-hmm. uh, not much salmon farming and stuff like that. No, no. But there was still no fish. <laughs> still no fish. Okay. I mean, I, I spent I don't know how many years on the on the on the Stuart Island. I never actually saw a salmon. So you never caught a salmon there. No, no. Neither did they. No. So, it wasn't just me. I mean, we fished weeks and weeks and weeks and never saw a salmon. But you got the cast and you got to be pretty yeah, good at it. Yeah, but, you know, no, it's part of the game. I mean, it's, I don't know, maybe the way I grew up or how I started my salmon fishing career by catching nothing. But <laughs> for me, it's, for me, salmon fishing is not a numbers game. It's getting one. Mm-hmm. And the harder it is to get, the more satisfying it is. You know, that's why I love steelhead fishing. We'll get into that later on. Yeah. But so when did you start traveling for fishing, you know, more outside of Scandinavia? Because I know you fished a lot of places. Yeah, I, I mean, that probably started when I came here, for real. I mean, that's... Um, um, I can't even remember when that was, 2001 or two or something. Okay, let's let's then just go back to that. What what brought you to Iceland? Originally? Met the wrong people at the right time, or <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just finalizing some of my studies, and uh, I was invited to come up here. A friend of mine had a lease on a river down on the south coast. Which and one? Grand Lake. Grand Lake. Okay. Uh, Ah, you were with the Danish guys that were in Sækkelbúðir, or? Yep. Yeah, okay. They're they're still fishing there. Yeah, I know. I know. So your first connection to Iceland was Sækkelbúðir? Yep. And how was that? That was great. Yeah? Yeah. That was fantastic. And then I met Thruster at the time and uh, got an invitation to come and guide or and help out. And, mm-hmm. and I think... Maybe it was because I was an Utlending people at the time, but, <laughs> you know, it wasn't going... Back in those days, it was not like you had to earn your sort of your marriage, right? It was, it's like I did a lot of painting roofs and helping with the small. And mm-hmm. I, wasn't, I wasn't stepping in uh, directly into salmon guiding as, you know... No, you had to pay your dues. Side. Yeah, exactly. So I did a lot of the... Uh, Trout guiding and, and char and stuff. That was what I did in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And actually, I went back to trout fishing last summer. It was amazing. I for, totally forgot how cool it is. But uh, no, that's what I did for for the first years I was here. It was good. And where were you trout and, and char guiding? For Mini Battle Lake and Grand Lake and stuff like that. Yeah. The thruster. Mm? Nice. Mm. And then you got into the Ronco or? Yeah, well, I, uh, actually, I was invited to fish the Rango once, and I fished for 20 minutes and said, no thanks, I'm out of here. <laughs> 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 and went back to Minivalley. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Rango maybe has a bit of the canal. Uh, yeah, but it's also the green weed in it on the West Rango. Huh. Well, that's what I didn't like. So, But, just uh, like. but I mean, green weed, Klaus mm. doesn't like that. But I know I for a fact to, I, got, I know for a fact I, I you like like so not to, to learn how to love it. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. But I have to say, when I fished the Rango at that back in I, I can't even remember it was back in the early two thousands, I never seen so much green weed. Mm-hmm. You know, that was you could not chug a fly in there and had it swinging for five seconds. Uh. It might just have been a special year. I don't know. I haven't really been there since. Uh, that was, I mean, early 2000s. That was, there was another 
Danish guy in Rangao, uh, Henrik Mortensen, mm-hmm. and, and of course we have we have you, and then we have the third Danish super fisherman, N- Nils. What mm-hmm. is it about Danish guys in in Iceland? They I don't all, know. They all become famous and <laughs> or notorious. Or notorious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but but I think you all have combined that uh, sort of that uh, control over a double hand rod, which seems very foreign to most Icelandic fishermen. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I actually do most of my fishing single-handedly. Yeah. Yeah, except for my steel hunting bun. But I also connect you a lot to Norðurá, and, and you you've spent quite a lot of time there, and, yeah. and you still do. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's good. What's it about Norðurá? I don't know. I mean, so I guided a number of years for Thruster. And then I met the terrible three at the time, Pali Vedehus, Gisli, mm-hmm. and Sigi Hugo. Mm-hmm. And they approached me in, I can't remember, so many years ago, 2004 or five or something, and asked me if uh, I would join their team. There was like three, three guides, and they asked me if I would join them. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I was on probation for a while, like a prospect, like, yeah. <laughs> um, and then finally became a full member of the, the Terrible Four. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So, so and we I guided mean, for, a, for a number of years together, and it was fantastic. I learned a lot from those guys. And I mean, you went all over probably with them. They oh, were, yeah. you know, the Grimsá, Laxva Kjós, Kjós, Nodrao, Angao, Hofsá, Nice. Never so went to Grimsá. No, the Grimsá, because I knew I know they were, they were selling a lot of stuff in those years, oh, and they had kind of managing the, the fishing for some for some companies at the mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what they hired me into to help out with. Yeah, yeah, that was good fun. Yeah, those were both good years for for salmon fishing, and mm-hmm. and there was a lot of. Let's say I mean there was a boom in the Icelandic economy and and Icelandic salmon fishing. Mm-hmm. So what what in particular about Norðurá? Because I haven't fished it myself, but of course everybody talks about it. Ah, oh, it's uh, I think thanks. I think it's the the the. Um, you have a- everything in Norðurá. You have the the meadows at the top, right? Uh, with the the pebble and the in the bottom, and and then. You get into the middle section where you sort of got the lava beds, and and, and then you get into below Laxfoss into the canyon. So you, it's like three different rivers in one, mm-hmm. right? And it's not just small sections of, like in some rivers where you have okay, you have a kilometer of meadow-like thing. Yeah. Here it's like solid sections of the river that are substantially different. So I think that's interesting. You have to. Change tactics from going from one beat to, thanks, from one beat to the other. So and I mean, of course, it also has a, to some extent, still that June fishing, which is oh, can yeah. be very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Especially last year was amazing. Was it? Oh, the spring fishing was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And you're, I mean, well, you're you st- call it spring fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but of course, June is technically summer. Mm-hmm. But uh, you're still going there. You you yeah, still yep. need. Oh. Do you feel you need to go to Norðurá yes. every June? Yeah, it's like coming home. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's your home in Iceland. <laughs> no, no, but I like it. I think it's a, it's a it's a beautiful spot. It's, I mean, if we can get another spring or s- early summer like last year, it was fantastic. I mean, a lot of fish from seventy five and up to I think I landed a ninety nine centimeter. Ooh. Tried to step on it to make it a hundred, but <laughs> <laughs> didn't work. No, in Kriyolmi. Yeah, I'll Kriyolmi. that's that's not a place too many people fish. I know. So you found him there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Yeah, maybe I have to sort of take my Thero Karo hat off one of these days and try Norðurá. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I I guided the bit on the on on Thero. Mm-hmm. That's a nice river. I like it. It's yeah. good. So, Klaus, I know in those years also, you being a, a full-time sort of fishing guy, you know, guiding in the summers in Iceland and 
and designing tackle, which we'll get into a little bit later. You also mm-hmm. ended up in Argentina. Yep. How did you? I mean, Iceland and Argentina from Denmark. It actually, it's connected because um, an old friend of mine, an American guy called Reed, he, um, I knew him from Denmark. Uh, we fished a lot together, or quite a bit together. Had mutual friends in Denmark. Um, he was a, a military guy. He was um, was he at the Ramstein base in Germany for the U.S. military, and then moved to Europe and moved to Sweden. And he had a business relation with a good old friend of mine, and we met up and started fishing together. He used to come and fish here in Iceland okay. every year, so uh, we were good friends. And he, uh, I met him up here in Iceland. He said. Um, I'm building this lodge in Argentina. Do you want to come and guide with me? So I'm like, why not? It'll be fun. So and then he ran the lodge for a year, and then I took over running the lodge after guiding a year. So I was is the that, camp comedian after that. <laughs> is that in... Uh, Putres. Yeah, Las Putres, Rio mm-hmm. Gallegos. Mm-hmm. I mean, was was Krista involved in those days? Also? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Him and Reed. Reed built the lodge. Christopher mm-hmm. was financing the stuff. And I mean, he's quite the character. Uh, Loop was sort of flying off the handle in those days. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of stuff happening. Um, you know, some people say the, the Golden Age. I mean, the Jörn Andersson series and the Danielson reels and, and all of that. Did you mm-hmm. get involved with Loop early on as well? Uh, early 90s, yeah. Huh? I mean, the fly shop I worked in was probably the don't think it's unfair to say that we built loop to mm-hmm. what it became not saying we built it to what it is but built mm-hmm. it to what it became in those years i mean we i think correct me if i'm wrong but we were selling something like 800 to one th- because loop was the distributor of sage in scandinavia in those days yes and we sold about somewhere around 800 to a thousand sage rods and blanks in denmark a year Whoa. There's a lot of blanks being built, right? Mm-hmm. So it was a cheaper way of doing it. Man. So it was sort of in that that range, and we we sold an awful lot of loop lines, fly lines. And, um, yeah, so... I mean, in those days, the, the loop shooting heads were were the thing, basically, yeah, to have. Absolutely. And they're still good. I mean, I still have them. Yeah? The custom lines? Yeah, I still fish them. It was an it was interesting period, because... People here in Iceland used them a lot for single hand rods as mm-hmm. well, and we're mm-hmm. cutting them back, yeah, and yeah, yeah. splicing running lines onto them, mm-hmm. and it was a it was a big fat. And how was live in Argentina for a, for a Danish guy? So it was a cultural shock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, Gallegos no, is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, not. A, I wouldn't describe a, a bustling metropolis. No. And especially not in those days. I mean, when we started coming there, the airport was like, you can imagine a, 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 a bus stop in Bakkefjord. <laughs> right? So it's basically just you step off and your bag is standing on the ground. That was <laughs> how the airport was back in the old days. Right? The, the, your, your luggage would come, when you landed with the plane, you would go in and your luggage would come with a tractor being driven into the room. <laughs> so that's how it was. Yeah. And then the population was only, I think the, the town of Gishegas was like 60,000 people. Mm-hmm. And then it grew when I left 10 years later or nine years later, whatever it was, to almost double. And it's all just circulating around some oil refinery or something? They found oil and gas down there. So yeah. the population just exploded. But how was the fishing? That was good. The first year we had, so eight rods per week, 13 weeks, we landed 3,300 sea trout the first season. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then it went downhill. What do you think drove that? Uh, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things. Uh, so El Nino was very strong in the mid-2000s. I remember that being on the news. Mm-hmm. How do you think that affected So. 
less rainfall in the Andes. So the river was generally lower the following years, and we started seeing algae, <laughs> a little bit like <laughs> like Laxo and Alta, yeah. big lumps of algae drifting, and the biologists down there had never seen anything like it. So I think something changed, maybe not enough water on the spawning beds, and I don't know. And then probably there was some net fishing in the river, and yeah. that sort of... I don't know how it is today. I haven't really touched space with the boys in a long time, so I don't know what the numbers are today, but... I, I mean, I, I fished there last winter, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's definitely not a, a numbers fishery. It's it's tricky. It's, it's difficult, I would yeah, even yeah. say. And of course, low water. And I think they're experiencing low water also this year. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of fish there and, and some <laughs> stupidly big ones as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some big fish around. But yeah, no, it was a great experience and I wouldn't have missed it, you know, for anything. But it's good. It's fun. And then, of course, back in those days, the whole thing was just unexplored. Mm hmm. We started steelhead fishing on the Santa Cruz. It's like nobody's done that before, really, on a fly rod. Jurassic Lake. Yes. The first white man to fish Jurassic Lake. You were in that group. I was the first white man to fish it. I was not in a group. Yeah. You were just alone up there. With a, our, we had a steelhead guide in on the Santa Cruz called Mario. So him and I went on this expedition. It was a crazy trip. I mean, you're, you've driven in Patagonia. It's like the road, you can see the road for 30 kilometers, and it's just gravel, and it's just yeah. straight. Yeah. And suddenly the temperature gauge in the car just went, so the engine block cracked in the middle of nowhere. Ooh, so shit. I was standing there one and a half hour waiting for another vehicle to come by. No mobile connection, nothing. I mean, back in those, in the early days in Argentina, we. We had a satellite phone, mm -hmm. and you had to stand on your right leg with your left finger up in the air in a certain spot in the garden to get actually connection on your satellite phone. It was a, it's, it was a crazy place, a wild place back in the days. Now it's more civilized. You have internet connection in the lodge and stuff, right? But, I mean, barely limited hours. They turn off, uh, I mean, electricity is by generator oh, and, yeah, yeah. and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's still a, a very wild place, it feels yeah, like, yeah. but I can't. But, so we were towed up to a small village in a swamp. There was like eight million mosquitoes, and we slept in this hellhole of a room. And next day, picked up by the owners of the estancia and the lake and went up there and fished, and it was crazy. I mean, it was just a wild trip. I mean, a lot of people have seen probably thousands of videos and photos of that lake today. Is it like still the same as yeah. it was? I, I don't know. I haven't been there for oh, a long okay. time, but I don't think the number of fish are the same anymore. No. And it also depends where you go on the lake. So where Luke built the lodge later on at the mouth of the river, mm -hmm. it was crazy. It didn't matter. You know, it was like, okay, open your fly box and you would look, what will they not eat? <laughs> and you're, uh, aha, the ugliest fly in the box tied on, chuck it up, oh, another one, fuck. You know, that's how it was. Almost. But if you walk like five kilometers away from the river, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. They were much more picky. And ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. well, tell me a little bit about this Santa Cruz steelhead fishery that you talked about. Wh mm -hmm. What is that? Well, it's basically the same strain of fish as is in Jurassic Lake that uh, is in the Santa Cruz. So rainbows, and they. I don't know if they migrate far away into the ocean. I don't know if anybody did any studies, but they're definitely in the coastal region. You know, the, the Santa Cruz is a big river. It, mm -hmm. it empties the Lago Argentina, so it's like 480 kilometers of just massive glacial water. And so um, these rainbows live in the estuary and so sort of go in between salt and fresh water, as far as I understand. They're quite big. You know, I'm not like... Not like North American or Canadian steelhead, but still good size. You know, mm -hmm. eight, ten pounds, maybe bigger. But it's hard to find the right. You know, you have to be lucky with the water because Lago Argentina, uh, it's of course, glacial, and it depends on the water flow out of there and the the clarity of the water. 
I've always been unlucky. Always been muddy when I was there. Uh. But it's a cool fishery. It's a lot of islands down in the, the lower part of the river, and you would sort of have a little jet boat going from one island to the other. And, uh. mm. I haven't heard this before, mm -mm. really. It's not really talked about that maybe in Europe or... Now the boys, um, all the guides that used to work in the lodge, and I don't know if they still do, but they have this Tres Amigos outfitters. Oh. They have a lodge up there, higher up the river though, on the Santa Cruz. Well, I mean, so we, it, it's it's a it's an interesting part of the world. I mean, there's there's a lot of kings. Yeah, and they belong in the Pacific, but back in the was it seventy six or something when the fish farming collapsed in Chile, they basically just released all these kings they had in pens, in the nets, right? So. All these fish spread into the Chilean rivers, and some of them moved around and went into the Santa Cruz. Because suddenly they started catching fish. There was a small river way, way into the one branch of Lago Argentina. It was uh, called Rio Catarina. They started catching these kings, and I saw the biologists, they followed them, and you just saw the average size started growing from the 80s. I think the average was like three point something kilos, and then just uh, now you, they get the, I mean I think the biggest one I caught there was like 15 or something kilos yeah uh, shit uh, but I mean had I probably landed 10 fish around 10 kilos in one day or something uh, right so it's a crazy fishery now they get them even bigger so the average size is just growing but that's that's like I don't know yeah, they go up through the Santa Cruz but they come when the season is closed so you can't fish for them so they come in December. And then they go into Lago Argentina, and Lago Argentina has the same volume of water as the Baltic or something. It's like huge, uh, okay. enormous. So we went on this expedition like in a super fast going boat into Lago Argentina, crossing I don't know how many glaciers dumping into the lake, and it was crazy. And then uh, into this branch, and they would just run the boat up on the beach and you jump off the boat and there was a small estancia somebody built 100 years ago that turned into it's a national park so somebody had sort of made a little lodge there and there was the rio catarina and we started fishing for these things that was pretty cool it would have been an exciting time to be there oh, yeah, just absolutely. exploring yeah. all of this like stuff. we went over to chile and fished like the torres del Paine national park on rio serrano that was you know, we, we were probably the first ones actually catching these kings on fly rods. There was a lot of local Chileans fishing with spoons and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they saw us with fly rods and they were just laughing at us like. <clears throat> and then when I hooked number five, they were like, oh, mm, what's going on out there? Que pasa, amigo. Que pasa. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. That's, yeah, obviously we need to look better into traveling to Argentina for, for other things than sea trout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. So, if we go back to Iceland, you were fishing or guiding uh, all over the west and, and a little bit out east as well. Mm -hmm. Today, you are mostly found after June on the on the east coast. Mm -hmm. Was that just through Gisli and, and Palli? You ended up in Hofsosela? Yeah, I mean, so I was when I was guiding with Gisli and Palli and those guys, we did quite a bit of work on the Hofsa and the Selo. And then for a few years, I was not guiding there so much. I was mostly here on the West and Aldalo and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of guiding on Laksan Aldalo with the Nest Boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, then, uh, I mean, that sounds very much like your style of fishing. Uh, a lot of fishing, catching the one, odd one. Odd, odd one. Mm -hmm. But again, and when it turns into a competition, I'm done. Yeah. Mm. Did you feel that? Oh, a lot. Yeah. And then I, I, one of the things that that wasn't, it was fun, but it also destroyed something. So you know, when you, we used to open the the, the nest beat there in July, first of July, and three days ahead. And on a good year, we would be, and that was all good fishermen, guides and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So we would have, 
I don't know, on a, on a good year, we would probably get eight to ten fish maybe mm. between us for three days, opening days. And uh, one year we had nine to one. I remember that. Yeah, in three days. And it was crazy. I mean, all the fish, they came early. I caught one the th second or third of July that looked like a September fish. Yeah, Big I, old cockfish. They came in May or something. Hadn't seen a fly or nothing. I saw, I've seen a picture from a friend of mine that was trout fishing in just 15th of June or something. Mm -hmm. and, and he got a 100 centimeter cockfish that had a big kipe on it and was just mm -hmm. dark colored like an August fish. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how they, uh, it's, it's very interesting how they all just came a month earlier than usual. Yeah. I mean, it was, it kind of destroyed everything. You know, you, 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 it was a struggle to get a fish. Oh, I struggle, but it was tough to get a fish. And mm -hmm. I got there in 2004 or five, six, when the fishing was really slow and it was extremely hot summers and, or whenever it was six and seven or I can't remember anymore, mm -hmm. but mid two thousands, right. When fishing was pretty bad, but, um, and then suddenly you get into this where you hook a fish and it's like, oh, it's just a little one, right? So just, uh, and it turns out you. to be 85. <laughs> it's like, it's not right. Uh, I think maybe it has something to do with also the marketing. I remember the Reykjavik Angling Club came in there mm -hmm. and I think they got in that summer, that big summer you speak of, uh, something like a hundred fish that were reported to measure a hundred centimeter or over. Mm -hmm. And the marketing was all, go to Laksan Adler, you're not going to catch many, but you will catch a hundred centimeter. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go there to catch an 85 or even a 95, you wanted that hundred plus. Mm -hmm. So you felt that mentality sort of change after after that crazy summer. Or I changed before that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's... I've always said you don't you you know the the big lacks should not be sold on either size or numbers. You sell it for the experience. It's it's a it's a un, unique place to fish. It's it's Definitely. so unlike any other river that I know of in Iceland, at least. Yeah, I mean, there's only one like that. True. It's a big spring-fed river that's mm. not cold. It's warm. Yeah. It has a great history as well. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's, a, it's an amazing place, but. Start selling it on numbers and size is wrong. It's it's like I don't know. I was talking about this earlier, like not being competitive, and I think like it's along with Instagram and Facebook, it's become a it's, it's become a, a so me sport, you know. So on the steelhead fishing, I woke up one morning the other, uh, just before Christmas, and I was, I've been wondering with myself why I love steelhead fishing. It's, it's, I, I just love it. It's great. I can fish every single day while I'm in America, every day from morning to evening and not be bored. I don't catch anything. Oh, I do, but it's, it's not a numbers game, steelhead. It, it's just, if you fish for steelhead, you, it's, it's like, it's a sport. It's a, a lifestyle. Sport. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, and that's another thing. Now you don't go to Argentina in the winter. You finish here, you're guiding in September in Iceland, and mm -hmm. and you disappear to Idaho. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Tell us. It's yeah, just so, it's so random. I know. It's not Washington. It's not BC. No. It's, it's not even Oregon. Yeah. It's in the middle of fucking Idaho. Oh, redneck <laughs> heaven. Yeah, it's perfect. It suits you. Oh, it's great. <laughs> no, but I mean, so... Just to finish this, like the salmon fishing has become very extremely competitive in terms of numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. right? So I woke up one morning the other day and I was like, now I know. With the steelhead fishing, you're happy for one fish, right? That, that'll make your day. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you get it or somebody else gets it. One fish is great. It's a fantastic fish. And salmon fishing, one is never enough. It's a little bit like potato chips. You have to get number two. You have uh, to get number three to come back to the lodge and be the man. Exactly. It's not what it's all about. Uh, that's very. I mean, salmon fishing in particular, I feel, is 
is more eco-driven than just trout fishing or, mm -hmm. or like you mentioned, your insight to steelhead fishing. Mm -hmm. It's more about numbers, you know, like in trout fishing, it's, yeah, we had a good time. It's not always how many. No, no, no. no. How big. I mean, and it's, so of course, it also depends who you're fishing with. But I, I, like I said, I went back to trout fishing last summer in Laxadala, fished with some British friends of mine, and we saw this big trout rising in the side channel. And this guy came driving, and he hadn't caught anything. He's like, hey, you need to catch that. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, yes, go and fish that. And he wouldn't. So he went on fish somewhere else. So me and my friend, we were sitting on the bank discussing who was going to catch this fish, right? So it's not like, it was, a, it was the opposite, right? It's like, yeah. no, I don't want to catch it. You go and catch it. No, I don't want to. So, right? So it, it was, it's great. And yeah. it doesn't matter who catches it. No, exactly. So uh, it's, I would agree with that. And I've noticed also when, when you're doing like... Uh, Let's say you have one of these evenings where you have like experts coming to talk about trout fishing and you have experts coming to talk about salmon fishing. Mm -hmm. and there are two different evenings. In the trout crowd, you ask for questions. You get loads of questions. Leaders, dry flies, nymphs, everything, rods, tackle. But in the salmon game, nobody wants to sort of admit that they don't know everything. So you get no questions. No. And the speaker... You drove on a Friday evening to listen to is an idiot. <laughs> Who does he think he is trying to tell me how yes. to catch a salmon? Or exactly. It's always, of course, just his perspective, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you almost cannot get a discussion going without it turning toxic very fast. No, no. And, and nobody's willing to admit that they don't know about leaders or it's, it's, it's drastic. Mm -hmm. But if we go to Ito, Klaus, mm -hmm. I mean, all of your random escapades, Norway in a train, Iceland, then to Argentina, why Ito? How, how does a Danish guy with a tan end up in Ito? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all accidents, actually, but I was... Uh, so Loop had a distributor in the northern part of Ito, in Coeur d'Alene, Ito. And... Um, I went there quite a bit and uh, did some casting stuff and mm -hmm. helped out with the loop products and stayed in a, oh, in an apartment or what should I call it? It wasn't really an apartment, but there was a bed and a sink and... Motel situation. Uh, no, it wasn't <laughs> even like that. It was worse than that. On the top of the fly shop. Right? <laughs> okay. So, so I, I lived there for a while and it was pretty fun. You know, it's a great part of the world. The west coast of America is pretty friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, got to know various people over there. And uh, they invited me fishing one spring, and we were driving down to... We were going to fish. It's a tributary to the Clearwater River. And then we drove up along the Clearwater. It's 75 miles so it's like, what's 100 and something kilometers along this river. And I was just like staring at this river. It's like beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's like amazing. Big, big river, but it looked like some of the salmon fishing I've done in Norway. is like amazing, fantastic water. And I'm like, why don't we fish here? No, 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 no. We have to go up to this tributary. It's springtime, so all the fish. It's a, it's a funny situation in America. They, they, they allow fishing way into the... So steelhead spawn in the springtime, they spawn in April. And they allow fishing in the most important spawning tributary, almost up to the spawning. But but you're not allowed to fish the main river. Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay. But at that time, most of the fish will have moved into the spawning oh, tributaries. Yeah. So, so we went up there and fished. And it's all nymphing with beads and indicators and... Mm -hmm. So I found myself a white plastic chair along the riverbank, sat down, drank a six-pack of beer, watching the other guys fish. <laughs> that was my experience on that. But, yeah, I don't know. It was, and then, you know, I started fishing the main stem of the river later on, the, ne the following season. And I didn't know anybody, and so I just had to learn to do it on my own. Caught nothing for days and days and days and days. And first year, 
probably hooked one fish and lost it again. And but you can't really sort of steelhead are slightly different than than Atlantic salmon. They place themselves different in the river, so you think it's the same. But being a salmon fisherman, so you 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 try to fish them like salmon. It works a little bit, but not really. It's a different. You have to fish them a little bit slower, and not because the water's colder or anything. It's just they're more trout-like than salmon. Mm -hmm. So I sort of slowly got to know some of the locals, and they would take me out, but not probably not showed me the best spots, but at least some spots. Yeah. And you know, you start getting a, the odd fish in there, and then you figure. I I won't say I figured it out, but I just got to know the right people. And, you learn. It's an interesting culture. Like you said, they fish every day. I remember I, I once tried to fish for steelhead. Didn't mm -hmm. catch anything. I enjoyed it, though. Mm -hmm. On the Queets in, in Washington, and you would meet these characters that live in, like, a camper van mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the National Park. Yeah. And they just drive between the rivers, smoke a lot of weed because it's legal there. It's not an Idaho. <laughs> not an Idaho. <laughs> no. Not yet, at least. And they wear, you know, a gun on their belt, and it's yeah, yeah. it's definitely a, a culture. Oh, it is. Uh, it's it's. And fishing there is basically free. You buy a, buy a state license. I think I paid eight dollars or yeah. something for my Washington state license. Probably, in Idaho, it's thirty-seven dollars for three days, or yeah. one hundred and twenty-five bucks for a year. And so it's as a non-resident, but. You know, and then you can fish any any body of water in the state of Idaho. If you can get there. Yeah, but high water mark. Mm. Yeah, you can walk that. Yes. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there a lot of people in Idaho fishing these center pins and... No. None of that stuff? Not or very, not very, very little? Much. Not like very center much. pins, plastic worms and egg beads and... There, there, there's jet boats with people sort of side drifting beads or pulling plugs or yeah. something on the river. But the river is so huge. I mean, it's the sort of the, the so it's enormous in the springtime when the when the snow melts in the Bitterroot Mountains. So they me, they measure it in feet per second. So I, Yeah, we will never understand. No. <laughs> but so summer runoff will be main below there's a confluence, the Middle Fork and the North Fork. I mean so the lower part of the river will flow with like 5,000 CFS or 6,000 CFS. Hmm. And it's pretty shallow, so it can be 100, 100 meters or 150 meters wide. So if there's a boat in the middle, it's a fly fisherman, it doesn't really matter. If there's a yeah. dude on the other side, who cares? Yeah. What's the season? If you Let's say you were going to go steelhead fishing in Idaho. I mean, let's... You're miles and miles from the ocean. Mm -hmm. When do you want to be there? The fish starts running in end of July, August. Very high water. That's a summer run, or it, they, these are called summer run anyway because they enter the Columbia River already in July. Mm -hmm. We start seeing the numbers in 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 the Bonneville Dam and going upwards through the Columbia. Start sort of. Number starts increasing in July, June, June, July. And then September, depending on what dams you're looking at. So there's a lot of dams. It's like four on the Columbia and five on the Snake before they reach uh, the Clearwater. But uh, you'll start seeing the first fish come in in end of July, maybe. Mm-hmm. Very high water, extremely hot weather, so you're fishing in shorts and wading boots. Nice. Yeah. I fish there quite a bit in September. Be 30 degrees. So you're just fishing T-shirt. There's no biting bugs, really. So yeah. it's like here. So T-shirt. But you mentioned all the dams, because mm -hmm. America, obviously, with their, with their great economy and, and their sort of 20th century economic boom mm -hmm. um, they put a dam in every river and a lot of them um, decimating a lot of the sea trout populations um, so are you seeing are these hatchery fish or are they wild? they have to be they have to be 
because if it's so in the U.S., the steelhead is on the endangered species list. So if there's no hatchery in the river, you're not allowed to fish for them. Mm. So in order to have a recreational fishery, you need to have a hatchery. So I've, you know, I don't know the percentage of wild because there is a big population of wild fish. Mm -hmm. And and this it's rather interesting uh, when we look at the catch rate on fly rods, wild versus hatchery. And they actually did a did a big study in the Columbia River and the Snake River on hatchery mm -hmm. versus wild fish. And I think you see it here in Iceland too. Um, with Atlantic salmon. It's it's a discussion nobody wants to take really, but it's quite interesting. I think it's a, my statistics over the years on the steelheading. Let's say that let's just I I I I don't know the exact rate between hatchery and wildfish. Just your feeling. Well, let's say it's just just fifty fifty. It's probably more hatchery fish than wildfish, but let's just say it's fifty fifty. So I fish ninety nine point nine percent with the floating line a single hook fly, mm -hmm. and a tapered monoliter. And I catch 99.5% wildfish. Mm. Interesting. Do you think that has to do with... Uh, Being wildfish. Wildfish <laughs> have to chase after their food. So why in Aranga, why do you have to... Why don't you hitch them in Aranga? Because you have to go closer to them. Why? Because they are always used to getting their food... Sinking pellets. Exactly. Any hatchery fish that has not that's grown up in a green gla glass fiber tank doesn't know how to look for food. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with the steelhead. With the steelhead there, the hatchery ones, mm -hmm. uh, are their adipose fin clipped off or yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can kind of tell. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. It's easy to, yeah, yeah. to see which one you're catching. Mm -hmm. but there's also this discussion in the U.S. about uh, how... I mean, there's no natural selection with these hatchery fish that they might be damaging because they, obviously they breed with the n with the natural fish mm -hmm. that they might be thinning out the gene pool, gene pool making the nat next generation of natural fish sort of less likely to survive in the wild they, they're more likely to be eaten by sea lions because they stay higher in the water column in the ocean and, mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. well, do you have an opinion on on this i don't know i'm not a biologist I didn't say you were a biologist, Klaus. <laughs> I asked, do you have an opinion? I have an opinion, and I think it's that simple. If you get rooted out the dumb ones in year one, mm -hmm. right? so if they manage to survive from egg to fry to smolt, going downriver through all the dance, through all the pike perch and whatever is trying to eat them, all the birds, all the sea lions, all the orcas, whatever, is trying to eat them, and they manage to f grow big enough to come back and spawn, I think they've proven their worth. Yeah, that's a, that's a way of looking at it. Right. And then it's a wild fish in my world. Mm -hmm. And I think nature has a pretty good way of rooting out the dumb ones. Yes. Right, And it's quite quick. So, in, and it doesn't, in my world, it's like we can all sit here and, and preach about how things were supposed to be. And we can preach as, until the steelhead or whatever fish it is, is gone. And then there's nothing we can do about it. Or we can do something. Because I believe that in, if you mess up a genetic pool a thousand years from now, it'll be the same again. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even a thousand years, maybe even a hundred years, maybe 20 years. Who knows? Nobody done the study. Well, they didn't in Denmark. It looks like the hatchery fish that we've been using in Denmark is now the same as it was in 1913 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you rerouted the river again. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think you can... If there is none of them left... There's also no interest in them. Right? It's only as long as you have a number of fish that there is a commercial, when I say commercial, I mean from a sport fishing perspective, an interest to to, to keep them alive and to do what's right. And, mm -hmm. 
and, and, and if if there is no interest and there if if there is nobody who wants to go and fish for them, well, nobody cares. That's very true, and I mean, but in a perfect world, of course, they wouldn't have to cross nine dams on the way to you. No. Uh, but, but the funny thing is, nobody's nobody's complaining when we had in two thousand nine we had six hundred thousand steelhead coming back. Mm-hmm. Okay, nobody was complaining about dams. No, right. And then the com- the, the population dropped to uh, I don't know a hundred thousand. Everybody's complaining. The the dams were there mm-hmm. in two thousand nine or eight or ten or whatever. Yeah, they were put up in the twenties and thirties. Exactly. So so it um. I don't know. The dams are not good. And of course they're not. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm saying. But it's not the whole reason. No. Don't just blame it on the dams. Because we had 600,000 steel coming in in, in 2000, as l- not longer ago than 2010. Mm-hmm. I think it was 600,000, but hundreds of thousands of them. Nobody's complaining. I remember catching four steelhead in a day. I haven't done that since. Yeah. I I know a, a guy who fishes quite a lot up in, in the Skina system. Mm-hmm. And they've been experiencing some, the last two seasons have been extremely low. I think you mentioned something like 10% of an average run. Mm -hmm. How's it been for the states? Similar? Um, Yeah, but numbers have started climbing up again. Mm -hmm. And we can think whatever we want about the U.S., but they actually study things that we never think about. They have this fish and wildlife. Fish and game or whatever it's called here and there. But so there was something called the Pacific Blob, and it goes for Canada as well and Alaska and everything. So there's an area of hot water that moves into the coast sometimes, and then it moves away again. And so it's called the Pacific Blob. So it's hot water, and it kills off these little crustaceans. I can't remember. They, they have a name in Latin that I can't remember. So it's a little crustacean thingy, that a shrimp-like thing that uh, all the smolts feed on when they leave the river. Mm-hmm. And they do not thrive in hot water. So all the smolts from steelhead or whatever goes into the ocean and there's no food. No. So I mean, what that's, happens? That's now they course. measured these numbers. And last year was the highest number they've seen since 2008. Okay. In 2008, the steelhead population went like this. Yeah. Okay. Climaxing so in it follows the, the, obviously, mm-hmm. follows the number of uh, food sources in the ocean. So the Pacific blob is moving further out again now, so the crustaceans are back. I mean, biologists have mentioned this also about the Atlantic salmon, that, of course, when they first enter the ocean, a small, that first source of of food needs to be available Mm -hmm. because they are at their most vulnerable there to Mm -hmm. to, to kind of start feeding. Yeah. That's interesting. Would you recommend for people to try their hand at steelhead fishing? It's for many avid fishermen a... A bucket list fish, so oh, to speak, a wild absolutely. steelhead. It, it's, if you're a salmon fisherman, and, and uh, I mean, th- I've done steelhead fishing also in BC and, and some of the other rivers in the US, and there's different styles and there's different techniques and stuff, like you were talking about with center pen, and it's a lot of nymphing and mm-hmm. with bobbers, you know, the thing about bobbers, the plastic indicators. And a double cheeseburger and a <laughs> and, you know that sort of stuff, which and is not very interesting in my world. And plugs and eggs and yeah. all that stuff. But where we are, it's 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 traditional. It's, it's it's so steelhead fishing is not like one thing. It's got depending on where you are, like on the P- o- OP the uh, the P- Olympic Peninsula. It's coastal rivers, very steep, very fast. Uh, a lot of rain. So a lot, lot of fluctuation water level, a lot of pocket water, stones, you fish behind them. So there's a lot of scattered line stuff done mm-hmm. there, and it makes perfect sense. Then you go up just across the border mm-hmm. and into Canada, you have like the Thompson River, which was the steelhead river in the world. Mm-hmm. Thompson River fish were enormous, gigantic size, all done with big, long rods. It's a huge river, uh, with like 15, 16 foot rods and... 130 foot casts and you know you were waiting to your tits and that sort of stuff it was a hardcore thingy right and, but rewarding in size of fish mm-hmm. and then that fishery is closed now the fish is pretty much gone and that's sort of the tradition that went back to the clear water where we are 
not the size of rods, but some people do. There's a lot of 15-footers mm -hmm. and 16-footers. But it's all floating lines and, and, and traditional flies, and, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a different world stepping on the clear water. So, I mean, there's also all other rivers, the Salmon River, the, the Grand Ronde in the vicinity of where we are, and the Snake itself, people fish there. And it's all different styles, but the clear water is just like this. It's warm, it's, the fish there are, especially the wild fish, it's very aggressive looking upwards. We, pretty much this last season here, we skated all our fish. Yeah, I mean, and when you're saying that, I mean, a lot of the traditional steelhead flies or just look like a green butt or a skunk or yeah, but like Atlantic we, salmon fly we yeah, know yeah, here. Exactly. Like Lady Caroline is one of the best flies on the clear water. Yeah. Old, 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 old salmon traditional fly. spay patterns with hair yeah. and hackles. Well, I can't say that's illegal, but <laughs> <laughs> used to be hair and hackles, right? Ever done like skating mice and stuff like that for them? No, foam stuff. Just foam stuff, yeah. yeah. So I've seen these epic like videos of steelhead crushing mice. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. It's like enticing. I want to try that someday. It's good. It's fantastic. I mean, you get you you go down to the to some of the southern rivers in Oregon. Um, to have some amazing fishing down there and skating all throughout the summer. It's, they, but there's it's just I think for Atlantic salmon fishermen, first of all, it's 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 a lot cheaper than Atlantic salmon fishing. Mm -hmm. Unless you go to the Dean or fly out helicopter trips and to luxury lodges and stuff. Copper River. Uh, yeah. But it, in general, it's a lot cheaper. And it's, it's, but it's a culture. It's something, you know, no, but from a fishing perspective, it's, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Right. It's speaking of, of steelhead, there's always the one big, uh, sort of discussion you, you come across on the internet and everywhere is a lake run rainbow steelhead Klaus. Oh, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> if I ever show up at the Great Lakes, I might be killed. <laughs> okay. I, I think <laughs> that that settles that. I don't know. But uh, it's the same discussion. It's the Baltic salmon and salmon. Mm -hmm. well, I guess they're landlocked steelhead. Uh, and the thing called the trout are landlocked uh, sea runs. Yeah. I mean, that's a they use the lake as a sea, you know, exactly. it's exactly. still a magnificent fish. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to ask you about, because you are now the head um, designer for, for loop, mm -hmm. at least for the, for the rods and tackle, mm -hmm. tackle part of it. Um, obviously, you've, you mentioned before you've been involved with loop since the early 90s. When did you get into designing rods and tackle? And while well, I was in Argentina, actually, it was. Uh, I think I just complained enough to Christer, and he said, "Oh, I'm done listening to you." Yeah, I mean, Christer Schöberg was obviously one of the founders of Loop oh, and yeah. an owner at that time. Oh. And he got fed up with me complaining, so he said, "Just do your own then." <laughs> what were you complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean there is. I can't remember. No. Probably just in that sort of time of my life where you had to complain about everything. Well, you still, you yeah, still you're, you're obviously still in that time of your life. I don't, I never, <laughs> grow, I never grow up, that's true. No, but, you know, I, I, I'm not saying you can do, and everything can be done better, but you sometimes need to do things different. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what sort of rods were the first ones you were working on? That was some extension to the old multi-series, I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in those days, they w you had the rods, you know, the yellow line, the gray line, and the green line. And Yeah, that was before my time. That was in, they came out, what, in 98 or 99 mm -hmm. or something. Uh, quite sort of some of them legendary, some of oh, them yeah. very much mistakes. I mean, Christer told us... Uh, Funny story about the yellow line, which is now very sought after, that it's just a painted green line. Uh, I think that's not entirely correct. But li li Exaggerating a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but what do you like about, about rod design? and What is it in you that drives you towards rods? Because I, 
I like good rods, but I. But it's so it's 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 so funny when you say I like a good rod because it's individually. Some likes one type of rod and some likes another. That's very true. Yeah. And most rods today are good for yeah, someone. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's uh, I think it's got. It's a little bit like, how should I put it? If you drive a car with a manual gear shift and you get step into another car with the the shift is different and you think, nah, it's not good, mm -hmm. right? So it's just because you're not accustomed to it. It's So rods have different actions and different speeds and stuff. So if you cast one type of rod, that's what your body, like I said, is muscle memory. So it's like, it's a habit. It's what you feel. It's hard, it's hard to describe what it is, but it's it's the speed where you move, how much you need to move, how fast, right? and then you grab another rod and that requires a different speed and movement, and then you think it sucks. Uh, yeah. Because it's just different. It's right? not it what doesn't you mean it's a bad rod, it's just different. The clutch is on a different point. Exactly. And then you fish it for two weeks and it'll be the best rod in the world because you got used to it. I have to say for myself, you know, I, you gather a lot of rods, mm -hmm. but you always have that one rod that you kind of do everything with because mm -hmm. it's the rod you just started using in the spring and you used it that season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I, I, I think that, how shall I put it without, it can easily come out the wrong way, but in my world there's only one action that works and when i say that it's not it's not like it's my way or the highway it's just like um a rod has to bend in a certain way mm -hmm. right if it doesn't bend in a certain way you uh, it becomes so difficult for you as a caster to achieve your goal so you could say that if you want the 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 easiest or the most efficient way of transporting something is in a straight line. So the rod tip needs to transport, the rod, rod, rod tip needs to follow a straight line. Mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine if you have a very, very stiff rod that doesn't bend at all and you move your hand, it's going to move in a half circle. Yeah. So it's not a straight line anymore. If you have, it's one of the problems with like some of the cane, old cane, super soft or super soft glass fiber rods, they move the other way. They bend in a down, down, they mm. deviate from the straight line. Okay, so in order for the rod to be, to follow a straight line, it needs a certain action. It's that simple, right? And the shortest point is where the rod tip passes your hand, the rotation point. Mm -hmm. There, the rod needs to be flexible enough to be under the straight line. Is that, it's, it's simple when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a rod that bends like, let's say, like this, okay, so it's a fast action rod. You can imagine that when it passes this point here. It's, it's great here, it's great here. It just bends the tip. But then here, uh. it becomes too long. Now it transports the line not in the straight line, or it transports the fly line in a less efficient way. Maybe for our listeners that are only listening, the, there is a video. He has a little piece of rod with him. So mm -hmm. yeah, he's to understand better what, what he's talking about, it's good to check out the video. Um, you, we were talking about, you were demonstrating, you know, sort of, because often I've named rods to you that I like, and you say, oh, they're faulty, they're, they don't work. This doesn't work. No, I never said that. <laughs> and, and then you were demonstrating it to me yesterday, how a rod design, and, and I'd, I had also this a similar conversation with, with Christer last year. Mm -hmm. It's when you have sort of dead spaces in rods and, and stuff like that, where, where everything is flexing on a, on a curve, and then all of a sudden you get a straight part, yeah. and that puts too much strain on the part behind it, and everything sort of uh -huh. goes out of sync. <laughs> It's uh, it's hard though to, because there's so much marketing around the rods. Mm -hmm. They're expensive oh, pieces of equipment. Yeah. There's so many things put forward, which are nothing more than marketing. Because it's a flexing stick. It's it's there's it, you need to create some narrative to market it, of course. Mm -hmm. 
but and then you have of course you have a rod any rod let's just take a 7x a rod you're very familiar with and it's mm -hmm. very popular the, the 11 foot 4 weight is not the same rod as the 9 foot 6 weight or the 14 foot 10 weight mm -hmm. even though it has, all has the 7x no name on it no no i know the so, way rod action should be and when you're trying to design something mm -hmm. like the 7x which is probably the most popular rod in Iceland right now. It's very successful for loop. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the ideology? Why is it a 7X at an 11 foot 4 or a 9 foot 4 all the way up to a 12? What makes it a 7X? What is the design thinking? Why is it, does it have the same name? And No, but it, so the 7X is because it's heptagonal shape. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's where the name comes from, seven sided. Does that matter? Yes. Or is it marketing? No, that absolutely matters. If you, and this is not. If you in construction have a round iron pole and you want to make it stronger, mm -hmm. what do you do? You make it edged, yeah. right? So now you made the rod uh, stronger. Not in terms of breaking; they can still break. But so what? What happens is you have a round blank. We also made round blanks. They're great. They're, I'm not, I'm not dizzing anything here. No, no. Round round rods are good. But what happens is when you when you bend the round rod, you can imagine the on the outside of the curve, carbon fiber stretches. Carbon fiber is really good at stretching. It really sucks at compressing. Mm -hmm. On the inside of the curve, it has to be pushed together. So when so what happens is that it'll overlies. And if it overlies enough, it breaks. Mm -hmm. But when it overlies, that's people talk about scrim values on the rods. It's the fiber that's wrapped around it to prevent it from overlying. But a round rod will overlie easier than mm -hmm. an edged rod. It's just simple physics. So it'll overlie, and it, it, I'm not talking about breakage right now. I'm just talking about losing strength, uh, losing power, yeah. and and how flexible they are in terms of line weights. So round rods are more sensitive to line weights than the heptagonal shape ones. Interesting. Simply due to the construction. And then they're more precise, the seven X's, but it's a, it's a, it's a little long hair discussion, but yeah. if you want to know, we can go there. Let's go there. I mean, I okay. think the more niche we go, plus the better. So any, any rod here have a spine and there was, so so this is a pre preg material that's wrapped around a conical steel tube called the mandrel. Mm -hmm. right? So there's an overlap of material somewhere. And you'll see when I twist the blank here, it jumps away. Yeah, There it is. It's built, it wants to go a certain way forward and a certain way back. It doesn't want to bend. And, and now, see the eyes are here, the rings here, are mm -hmm. set on the spine. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's hard, hardest to bend. It wants to jump away from that point. So you, here the, 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 uh, the rings are set on the hardest point to bend. So if you try to bend the rod this way, it's going to twist. Mm -hmm. You're okay. demonstrating this quite clearly. No, no. And, 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 the, and the spine is not necessarily the same here as it is down here. Oh. Because the, the, the material that this is cut from it's a triangle-shaped material. So the spine twists a little bit. Okay, so now we have four pieces of rods. So this piece, there might be, the, the spine direction might be slightly different from top to bottom. Same on this piece. Mm. Same on the third piece. Same on the fourth piece. So you can imagine, you might have, let's say at least just four different directions in a rod. When you bend this, it wants to twist, right? When you bend it, it'll twist on the easiest side. Right. Okay, so you have four directions now. It's trying to twist in four directions. Yeah. So, and one thing is, you you see it very physically on some rods, where your ferrules t tend to go loose all the time. Mm -hmm. It's because the it could be sanding of the ferrules, but very often it's because that they have different spines. They, different spines, so they'll twist away from each other. And, and and so so the spine also becomes uh, also affects when the rod unloads again, straightens out, 
it can have all kinds of directions within the blank itself. And nobody's, I haven't thought about it. It was just what, I, I thought about the blank because I built hundreds and hundreds of fly rods and measured out the spines. And mm -hmm. so I always try to set the rings differently. So not put them right on the spine, put them in between. So 45 degrees to the spine. So Interesting. I mean, that's partly probably why all old rods, even though they had connections, you know, that went into each other, they would always be taped and stuff like that. Yeah, I th I also less accuracy in the manufacturing process back in the old days. Mm -hmm. I mean, but um, the seven-sided rods also has a spine. But here you have the rod bending on a flat side because the rings are set on a flat side. Mm -hmm. And this is where the uneven sided comes in. If it's e even sided, like six or four, it doesn't work so well. So mm -hmm. uneven sided. So now we have the ring set on a flat side with steering uh, ridges on each side of the rod and a steering ridge uh, diagonally above the ring setting to control the, the bend. So now it'll bend over the ring side on a flat side, which is easier to compress, but it gives you the strength from the spine or from the ridge yeah, on top. From the ridges. Yeah. And the ridges on the side to control your direction. So there's all there, there, there's always gonna be a spine effect in any fly rod, doesn't matter what shape it is. But it's less influential on the on on, on the seven axis. And I, I I I we discussed this a long time, but Right, and it's, it's yeah. and but I mean, there is theory uh, behind it. And there's it, a theory it behind works. it, but it's always been like I said. You, you, I fished round rods my whole life. Never thought about it. Mm -hmm. And then you can always go, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. You've caught hundreds and hundreds of fish on round rods. It doesn't matter. And you haven't thought about it, so why think about it? But like I gave some prototype to some some of the hardcore trout guys and the fly show in America. And I said, just, I'm not even going to say anything. Go on, and tr try it. Just come back and tell me what you think. And they came back and said, well, it's amazing. It's like pointing your finger and there goes your line. Yeah. It's, it's a so very precise. accurate rod. Yeah. yeah. And, and it just proves the point that the spine actually has more effect than you would think. And mm -hmm. it's actually a physical thing that you can go out and test. So so I think, and if you ask me about it, it's the the... the, the the heptagonal shape of the blank is the greatest invention since carbon fiber. That's a big statement. I know. Everybody makes round rods. Finally, there's something new that actually has a proven effect. It's, yeah. it's taking fly rods to, an, to the next level. So where do you go from here? We just continue with new materials in the seven-sided. It's coming. Well, nice. Mm -hmm. When do we see it? I don't know. I've seen you with a prototype. Mm-hmm. So you're you're testing testing out new designs and stuff. Exactly. Uh, that's, yeah, I was hoping to get you to say something more, but I knew you weren't. But <laughs> I can tell you as much as I just finally approved the last sample okay. this morning on the car on my ride here. Perfect. Yes. So now they're ready to go. So next winter we will see some new before. stuff. Probably before. Probably mm -hmm. before. Oh, exciting. So. But you asked me a specific question why there is a difference between an 11 foot full weight and a yes, 14 foot exactly. nine weight. And this is, I know some companies try to make the same action throughout a series of rods. It's which, impossible. Which you can't do. Well, you can do it. But it's not going to suit every scenario. So we both know a, a top and fisherman, right? And I'm sure he doesn't want a nine foot full weight a dry fly action on his 10, nine foot 12 weight top and action. No. So it, it, you have to design your your um, your fly rods to the type of fishing that you're thinking they're supposed to be used for, right? And that sets uh, uh, that creates problems today when you have so many, especially in certain rod models, more than anything that has such a wide uh, range of use, like nine foot five weights. The classic nine foot five weight is a trout rod, medium, typical medium fast action, protecting your 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 tippets when you're dry fly fishing, 
that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's people using a nine foot five weight for for saltwater sea trout or yeah. salmon fishing even. So they want a faster action. So so the span in those in that line weight is too high in my world. So there, for you need two different rods, fast action and some with a slightly slower action for the mm -hmm. trout segment. The same with ten foot seven weights. If I'm going to fish a ten foot seven weight, I do not want a pole. I want because I'm going to use it for Atlantic salmon fishing or sea trout fishing. And I want a rod that can actually, now I'm going to say something that sounds crazy, but I'm going to use a rod that loads with a fairly uh, uh, easy uh, or, or fairly, fairly low line weight. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about line weight because I'm talking about cast that starts off the water where I, you only load the rod with part of the line. But at the same time, the 10 foot 7 weight is one of the most popular reservoir rods in the UK, yeah. right? Where it's all about chucking long lines or sinking lines far yeah. out into a lake. So and it's you may be standing in water up to your chest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or sitting on your butt in a boat. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah, so it's two different styles of fishing with the same rod. So you can't make one. No, it's like uh, it's like screwdrivers. I mean, you need a flathead, a Phillips head, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then a... Torque. Uh, torque. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for the save. <laughs> You you can't you can't say you can't cover it all with just one tool. No, no, no. Exactly. Dry, dry fly fishing or reservoir fishing no. or s salmon fishing. It's not necessarily the same rod. No. And then you know, of course you have to follow the trend. What's going on in the world? There was a trend with extremely fast action rods for a while. Mm -hmm. But luckily that trend is disappearing again. Yeah, we saw well, it does disappear. It doesn't matter because what happened was that people couldn't handle fast action rods. So, what do you do? You overline them. Mm -hmm. Then they become medium fast action rods again. And that's what everybody wants. They just don't know. That probably started, uh, yeah, in that period when the when the shooting heads were sort of moving into the single handed rods, and and the American manufacturers were coming up with a really fast action rods that were. Probably designed for bonefish or stuff like that, but mm -hmm. we were using it for trout and salmon. Yeah. But yeah, you see every, everyone is trying to get a little bit of more feel yeah. on the rods uh, nowadays. Finally. Finally. Yeah. That's interesting. We were also talking about, I want to ask you about lines. Because mm -hmm. now, I mean, we. I was asking you basically to give me a, a line yesterday that was three screwdrivers in one, mm -hmm. and it's just always three lines. What are your thoughts? Because I like to, we just talk about your single hand salmon fishing in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Rod, line. Mm -hmm. Just your versatile. I, I would say for most people in Iceland, it's a nine and a half foot seven weight mm -hmm. rod, it's fine. Okay, it used to be just a few years ago, it was always an eight weight. A nine foot eight weight. That's classic. Mm -hmm. Still is in Canada and some places. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But why for Iceland the nine six? I know Iceland sells a lot of nine six ten, while some other places might sell more nine. Why do we need that extra fifteen to thirty centimeters? I just think it's it it's easier casting a little bit longer mm -hmm. with the longer rod and gives you a little bit more control over the line yeah. when you're fishing. Nice. I'm personally not a big fan of 10-foot rods, but it's just me being lazy. They're too heavy on the hand. Yeah, the tip is uh, can be heavy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are not nice at all. They can no. be hard to control in wind. Yep. So for me, 9.5-foot is perfect, but it just it gives you... It, you just end up there between a 9-foot-7 weight, which casts fantastic, but it's too short, mm -hmm. and a 10-foot-7 weight, which fish is really got, but, uh, good, but cast like... A, you know, yeah, it's, right? it's too hard on your hand to do all day. And if you're not a very disciplined caster, you will open your loop up oh, yeah. too much for yeah. the wind. And yeah. I like 10 foot 7 weights, but just I think 9.5 foot 7 is perfect. Mm -hmm. For me personally, 9.5 foot 6 weight is my preferred. I fish everything with my 9.5 foot 6 weight. Yeah. yeah. Probably my, my favorite rod at the moment is the Loop 7X 966. Use it for salmon, sea oh, trout. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. But for most people, 9.5 foot 7 weight. So, but with lines, it's, it's, so weight forward lines have a, a belly section 
and a running line section. Mm -hmm. So we'll just forget everything about the running line. doesn't matter. It's just the belly <laughs> section that's interesting. That's what casts. That's your Toby spoon. That's the weight. That's the weight. And I always say you, you should not have a weight that is longer than the cast you need to make. Mm -hmm. So if you fish a tiny little river, uh, you need a short head or a sh short casting weight, the, the belly on the weight forward line. Mm -hmm. but I see an awful lot of people showing up with the fishing, uh, let's say July, low water, Northern Isle, with a belly that's way too long. Right. So th and that, what's, what, what are you doing then? Then you have to pull that head through the tip ring and then you don't have the right weight to load the rod anymore. Huh. So some very popular lines like single hand spay by Rio or something. It's mm -hmm. Very long bellies. Yeah, yeah. But if the river then is wider than your belly, you can always shoot line. That's legal. Mm -hmm. That's why you have a running line. Yeah. yeah. Right. But so you need to match this. Like I was talking to you about the trout, you know, if you, you need to load the rod for a short cast or mm -hmm. no, load it for a long cast. It's mm -hmm. not, not necessarily the same line. No. But it's also two different styles of fishing. But you can always you put it this way. It doesn't matter if it's single-handed or double-handed. The further away from your feet you want to fish the fly, the longer the line you need, the longer the belly. But it's not always possible, either through wind or to the sheer fact that you have trees or cliffs mm -hmm. or sheep or whatever behind you. So... The, this uh, we talked about it earlier is uh, about this that fly fishing is not just something you go out and and do and you order your three salmon a day in the salmon river right uh, it doesn't come in a box no, nothing here comes in a box fly fishing is you always if you want something you need to give something it's like being married i guess <laughs> and so so if you want something from a line like we were talking about trout fishing line you want a line that's very easily casted with a fairly short head, then you can't mend it on a great distance. No. So you gave something away for the ease. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if that mending part is important for you, then you're going to live with that. You have to cast a slightly more tricky line with a longer head. And if you don't have the room behind you to turn over that long head, then, you will, then you're not going to fish at all. My decision after our, our talk, it's just, it's too different screwdrivers just it's two rods two lines just for each task mm -hmm. that's the way it is or two reels or or two reels but that's why i used like i said to you i, I used to have one rod three different lines shooting mm -hmm. heads so i had one reel i always materialized this in underpants when i went traveling how many underpants can i have instead of three fly reels and two fly rods uh. Now I just needed one rod, one reel, ten pair of underpants, <laughs> right? <laughs> Instead of the other other way around. No, but and it's also a lot cheaper way of doing it. You have more lines than you have rods. That's very true. Yeah, it's. Uh, thank you for breaking it so simply down. It's because uh, I I know for a lot of people, rods and especially lines, because mm -hmm. rods are fun to buy. You, you own them for a long time. They're a fancy piece of equipment. But lines, people are very scared to get into. They say it's a jungle or, and all that. But it's when you break it down like that, it's it's not so hard at all. No. If you're fishing farther away from you, longer belly. If you're mm -hmm. closer in, shorter belly. And then you go into the taper of the line. It's, then it becomes a little tricky. But yeah, you, of you, course. You see some lines that has barely no taper. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of working on a leader that I like to control that line. But And if we believe that a nice light presentation is essential for any type of fishing, whether it's salmon or trout or whatever, you need a line that can actually present the fly nicely. Mm -hmm. mm, some lines won't. No, but sometimes you just need to, something to check it into the wind. True, but... Then again, we're back to the screwdriver thing, but there can also be the opposite of it's too nice presentation. Mm. No, I mean, if you have a... I've, I've seen it happen. 
a few times where people show up f- for salmon fishing in in like in Nodra where you sometimes have a heavy downstream wind with a very fine long front taper that you cannot then you're not in control of where it lands anymore so mm-hmm. the wind will turn it off to whatever side yeah and you and see it sort of how the line shoots out and, and then the front starts yeah. making a bend yeah and and then then you have the opposite it presents too nicely for the conditions mm-hmm. right so it's a give and take it's a give and take you can't have it all no yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what you what you bring us next from this Seven, the successor to the Seven X, or probably the Seven X, will still be around. But mm-hmm. oh yeah, of. yeah, yeah. This is this is gonna be. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna say too much, but it's. It'll be interesting. It will be interesting. No, the, it's it's a new material. And it's lighter and it's thinner and it's, it's it's pretty pretty cool. So we always have. I mean, we would be doing this podcast without our, our sponsors, and one of them is Tokyo, probably known as Tokyo Sushi. Mm-hmm. Um, and they always want to ask, what's the favorite? What's your favorite pool? Now it's February. When you daydream about fishing, where does your head go? What pool? Preferably in Iceland. V seventy eight on the cellar. V seventy eight. Yeah, you never heard about it. No, I no. never heard about it. <laughs> Exactly, my point. It's one of those places that nobody goes to because nobody caught fish there. And then when nobody goes there, nothing's caught there. So it's sort of a... It's a screw with no end. So it just continues going. Nobody goes, nobody catches anything, nobody goes, nobody catches anything. When somebody is dumb enough like me to go there, it's actually a pretty good pool. Yeah. Does yeah. it have a name or just a sign with V78? V78, I think it is. That's not your secret anymore, Klaus. No, I don't. But it requires a bit of walking, so I'm still... A, I told too many people now, but... No, it's good. I like that. What What particular is it about that pool? It's just nobody goes there. You're just alone? Yes. You know if there's two fish in the pool, you're going to catch, catch one because yes. nobody's... They haven't seen a fly for exactly. weeks. Exactly. For a long time. Now, I've told too many now, and I have to find another one. Uh, no, but it's it's... It's, I don't have a favorite pool, really. I think it's, I think it's there's there's interesting things happening in pools in Iceland that where they change. I think mm-hmm. that's interesting more than a favorite pool. I used to love Bakhilsbrot and Bloglanni in Nodra, but now you can have twenty fish in there and nobody wants to take. Yeah. Right. Back in the old days, when I say old days, for me, old days, early days, that you can go there, you can. You wouldn't go there without getting two or three fish. That was about the maximum. You could get out of there without before spooking all of them. Those days are over. It's also this thing about a great pool. Is it's not necessarily that they hold a lot of fish or something. There's always that fish that's in, you know, he's sitting in such a position where they feel comfortable, but mm. they're, you know, at the right depth, at the right speed, where mm. they're easily caught. So when you see one, you know, okay, this is a taker. It's often, what, you know, it's not necessarily the pool that holds the most fish. No, no, no it's the challenging one. Rice well good. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them. Uh, I love that one. Yeah, it's good. Especially for people that can't cast like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. Birgit Byrne. No, no, no. <laughs> one, 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 one pool I, I, I really, I miss quite often. It's one of my if I have to say one thing that I really liked was the uh, Vita Scavi in the Big Laxo, yeah. but fished from the island. Ah, so you take the boat over and fish yes. it. and you have to cast left-handed and walk it under the trees down the bank there. It's, it's challenging, It's it's, and you got into what did they call it, the Storlaxa Hola or whatever. Yeah. I hooked a few big fish in there. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a great, not many fish, but some. I mean, this is a spectacular pool with a spectacular name in a yeah. spectacular river. Exactly. But it's, it's uh, and especially they, they're late in the evening when you had their light and you would see. 
I, I've also been sitting on the bank while guiding, taking some pictures of the bow wave coming and meet the fly. It's pretty cool, you know. Yeah, it's a big. It's one of the biggest mirrors in Iceland. Exactly, yeah, and, you, and some big fish in there. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's. I caught some big fish in there. Some gr- spectacular takes, more most of all. Great. I I've once been to that island. I te- I, you know, I was going to uh, try my luck for the salmon, but being left-handed also. But uh, there were too many nice brown trout rising above and, and <laughs> doe filler that it, I got distracted. And then I was like, how was it? Oh, it was fantastic. Dry fly fishing for big brown trout. And like, we're not trout fishing. <laughs> <laughs> but I at least had a good time. So where are you going to be fishing in 2023, Klaus? What, what are you looking forward to this summer? I don't know. Or just your lifestyle being on the river? Yeah, no, I love being on the river. So it's it's great. We touched on your, your June is in, in Nordero, and where do you go from there? Uh, east of Sao Selo, I guess, mm-hmm. for July and August. Nice. No Jökla this year? Don't think so. Oh, nice. I mean, you couldn't have it much better. I mean, Nordero in June, and then Selo of Sao. Exactly. It's great. wonderful. And then home for check my mailbox, and then off to America. You're living the life, man. <laughs> I don't know. It is what it is. But, yeah, I'm the, especially, like I said, I love my steelhead fishing because it's, you fish with a great bunch of people. It's, it's a sociable thing. You We float down the river in our drift boats and, you know, you're two, three guys off together. Somebody falls in and everybody stops fishing, lights a fire, dries out his clothes and, you know. It's, it's it's really 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 good really fun and not maybe as as polished of pro- a product as Iceland is now often with the salmon fishing no I mean yeah and, and and true and again it's a bigger river and and you know you you you'd have miles of miles or kilometers of kilometers of fishable water right so you just pick whatever you think is coolest right it's not like there's no fish here oh well, there is but it's a bit froggy. We have this definition of slow water. It's called frog water. It's where uh-huh. a frog swims. Right, so uh, it's a little slow, so you don't bother fishing there. You just go to the fast stuff, which is also where the wild fish live. So hatchery fish like slow water. Birgit, I think we need to, to visit Klaus next autumn in, in Idaho. Yeah, and then yeah. living in a trailer, in a trailer park camp. I know I'm done with that. With <laughs> with with your with the back of the trailer where your bed is, two meters off the river. So you fall asleep every night listening to the river, and you wake up every morning listening to the river and the geese outside. It's pretty cool. Sounds very nice. Yes. Well, we're looking forward to seeing the next rod from Loop and sort of the development of Seven X. And and thank you for taking the time of to. Thanks for finally us. having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. <laughs>